Okay, after a bit of a hiatus, I want to finish up the relativity stuff we were talking about. It's not on the AP test, but it's just neat to know when I've left some things out. So the first thing I think I want to do is a, is a quick review. Remember we came up with uh, this factor gamma, uh, you know, and there was, uh, there was length contraction, there was time dilation, there was this mass increase stuff. Um, and then the really neat thing, the twin paradox that we looked into, that was pretty neat itself. So uh, having done all that, let me fill in some other stuff. Uh, one thing I didn't do was I didn't go back to the motivating question. The one where we were talking about the magnetic force between a couple of charged particles, say a couple of protons moving in the same direction. And I asked the question, you know, I said, you know, here goes a, a proton going this way. There's another proton here. I said they, those are, those are velocities. They have the same velocity. They have obviously an electrical repulsion. The electrical force, you know, repelling each other, Coulomb's law. I then said um, that they have a magnetic force attract. You want to call it F sub B for like magnetic, you know, B field. And we calculated the speed they need to move to get the electrical force equal to the magnetic force, let's see, um, I guess that was, um, you know, it's like mag there, that was KQ uh, squared, because the two Qs there, over R squared was the electrical attraction, the magnetic, sorry, that was the electrical uh, repulsion. The magnetic attraction was uh, Q times the Q, so it was Q uh, V squared, uh, there was uh, mu naught over 4 pi, and mu naught over 4 pi, but mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, and whoa, these canceled out, and by the way, this was over R squared too, that was over R squared, the R squared's all canceled out by the time we did this, we found the V was three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is C, the speed of light. And that means that at the speed of light, these two things would not repel. They would be in perfect balance. They would, uh, the magnetic attraction would exactly balance the magnetic repulsion. And the weird thing about that is that it seems to depend on our frame of reference because these speeds were defined according to us. I'm the one who says, that they flew past me and that they were doing this electrical and magnetic stuff to each other. But in their world, in their world, neither one is moving relative to the other. And there is no magnetic repulsion to them. Now, how do I reconcile this? How can this magnetic force exist for some things, for according to some people, some particles, and not exist to others. Maybe it's one of those relativistic things, and I'm going to explain it right now. What if they're moving at almost the speed of light, just a little shy of the speed of light? In that case, we'll have just a little bit less um, attraction than we will repulsion, and we'll find they're drifting apart slowly. How could I account for how could I account for that? If I see them fly by only slowly separating from each other with the accelerate, but, but not much, how do I make sense of that? They're supposed to be repelling strongly. Well, I can believe in magnetism. I can say there's a magnetic field, but what if I don't want to believe in magnetism? What if I just refuse? Just have to be different. Well, there's a way. You see, as they fly by, they're time dollars. Remember the mad scientist flying past? Sound like he's talking too slow? The time dilation by factor gamma? You know, and he's going like a thousand and one, a thousand and two, as he flies past, past at nearly the speed of light. Well, these things are going to be time dilated in their separation. You'll see them separating slowly, just like you hear them counting too slowly if protons can count. Not only that, there's another thing, too. This force is having to make two particles separate, have to make them accelerate apart, but their masses have increased because of mass dilation, you might say, or mass increase. I have more to say about that in a little bit. But uh, 
So I've got two reasons why they should separate slowly. And if you do the math, I'm not going to do that right here. I'm going to do a lot of hand waving. See, hand waving, because you know, you're not responsible for being tested on this. And I, I'm a little rusty myself, but I'm just going to tell you the neat stuff. So time dilation and mass increase explain why they don't grow apart very fast. Bottom line is, magnetism in this sense can be thought of as nothing more than a relativistic effect. It's like if you don't know relativity, you conjure up magnetism to account for the observations to get all consistent and everything. But you don't have to believe in the magnetism. I'm not saying not to believe in the magnetism. It's real for lots of reasons. But think of it as related to the electric field through relativity. In any case, I answered that question. And I just had such a eureka experience. I was sitting at the dentist's office when I was about 21 years old or something. Eureka. Remember, I remember I was in the dentist's office. Now, other things. Um, there's, there's the, oh, back to the E equals MC squared. Oh, the most famous equation in physics just about. It needs to be talked about. Everybody knows Einstein said that. Or a lot of people know Einstein said that. So what does it mean? Uh, how to interpret that? Well, first of all, um, there are different ways to write it up. Uh, one thing to realize is I just said a little bit ago that the mass increases with the speed. That means I could account for that this way. I can write gamma, the, the time dilation and length contraction and mass increase factor times m naught uh, times c squared. And this m, obviously m is that, and I've just said mass increase. But I was careful to say rest mass here. Now, you know, different textbooks, different people come up with different conventions of how they want to define words. And it's okay if they disagree on the definitions, as long as they're clear about it. I'll tell you that there's one school of thought group of people who like for mass to fit this and always be the mass even if it is increased. That's a choice. You can say that. You can say that's what you mean by mass. It's this thing that gets more when you go faster. Or you can say, no, 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 that's not what I mean by mass. By mass, I mean the mass it would have if you were holding it in your hand. You could call that the proper mass. There's also proper time and proper length, which are things determined by the person who's holding the thing and not moving relative to it. Well, if the mass isn't moving relative to me, I'll say that's its mass. I could say that's its proper mass. I could call it its rest mass. I could call it M naught, but some people choose not to put the naught, and they just think the equation should really be E equals gamma MC squared. Those are the best the people who want mass to always be rest mass. People who write this or in that say that rest mass is one of the masses you can talk about. But what about the, <laughs> the rest of the mass? Get it? The rest mass, and then there's the rest of the mass besides the rest mass. What is that? Now, um, and I'm going to actually admit I'm cheating a little bit off my nice little boards here because I have so many good things to talk about, so I'm going to kind of glance over there a little bit. Uh, so there's this idea, first of all, about the momentum thing. Um, momentum, you know, is supposed to be MV. The two traditions of what how momentum can be written are as follows. You can declare that momentum was born to mean mass times velocity. But if you say that, you have to like, like let that mass be the relativistic mass, including the rest mass and the rest of the mass. And then you would also write it as gamma m naught v. You can either say that momentum is always equal to mv, and m just increases. Or you can say that momentum is actually equal to gamma rest mass times v. So uh, that's, that's just a choice. You can do that. Now, when I get back to the energy thing, let me show you what I can do with that. Kind of an interesting thing here. Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase. No. Yeah, I'm going to erase it. I want to um, show you. Ooh, squeaky, squeaky. I want to show you something about this. You can write this. It sounds awkward at first, but I got my reasons. 
you can write this is gamma minus 1 m naught c squared plus m naught c squared. And, you know, that, that, is, that is this. I've just weirdly split out a gamma minus 1 and a 1. The reason for doing this is this can be named the rest energy because it is energy. Huh. Guess what the rest of the energy is besides the rest energy? What's the energy that's not at rest? It must be the, I think you got it, kinetic energy. This is kinetic energy. And you might say, oh, no, no, no. I learned that kinetic energy, E sub K, is, you know, um, or K, however you want to write it, is one half mv squared. What are you going telling me this for? What's that crazy formula? Well, if you put in what gamma is, and gamma is the one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. Um, sometimes I call v over c beta. I'll do that a little bit later in this whole presentation. But if you do this, it turns out you can write a Maclaurin series, if you've ever heard, there's Taylor series, Maclaurin series, kind of where you expand things around, and they have all these terms, and usually those terms get smaller and smaller, it depends on the situation, I think, but, but basically, I'm going to write this out, you can write E equals M naught C squared plus one half, I think you see where this is going, maybe you do, one half, making sure I got everything right, m naught v squared plus, and there's more terms, that's the part you wouldn't have guessed, 3 eighths m naught v, oh, I don't do, do my current series in my head, oh, there it is, yeah, v to the fourth over c squared plus some other terms, you go, what the heck, what is that? Well, this part's the rest energy, and the rest of it's the kinetic energy, and now you know, now you know, that it turns out the formula you learned for kinetic energy was merely an approximation in the special case that the speed is small compared to the speed of light. Because look at this term right here. If the speed is small compared to the speed of light, you ain't going to have much there. And this term and the rest of them just get pathetically small. And that's why it's this. It was an approximation all along. The kinetic energy thing was an approximation, a low speed approximation. That's kind of neat. Related to that, there are these things that I want to talk about for a minute. Um, turns out all this energy, momentum, everything, there's a whole world of kinematics and dynamics that you can do with relativity. I had to do this in at least one course, and I didn't do it so often to make it second nature. Um, but I will tell you a couple things I remembered, and actually just looked back up, you know, Wikipedia and stuff to make sure I got them right. One of those is that there are these things called four vectors. And, you know, a vector in space, in three-dimensional space, has got three components, X, Y, and Z components. What kind of component is there besides that? The time-like component, or the, the one that goes with time. And so you get these four vectors that are space-time quantities, not just spatial quantities. Um, one of them is just where you are. And where you are is this. If you write it as a column vector, it's, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. It's, it's CT, X, Y, Z. Now, that's nice. And you know what? There's also a four velocity. And the four velocity is C, V sub hex, V sub, well, I can write U. I like U. Sometimes you like U's instead of U. I like this. That's the four velocity. Then there's this thing called the four momentum. Now the four momentum, yep, yep, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, the four momentum is uh, a column vector. And I'll tell you that not surprisingly, these are P sub X, P sub Y, and P sub Z. Uh, the version I looked up, a little bit ago, wanted to put the C's after these things because they want. I'll tell you what, I've seen it done two different ways. You can put the E over C there and have the P's there, or some people like to multiply through by the C and call it like a four energy with energy units. But look at that. It turns out these quantities you've heard of before are only parts of a grander scheme, and that's kind of neat. In fact, uh, 
the world in which these things play is the world of space-time. And there's some things to be said about space-time. And uh, ideally, I would have a four-dimensional graph with uh, a t-axis and uh, three spatial ones. Maybe to make the units the same, to make it consistent, I could multiply the t by c, and that have ct, and you'd have that. Uh, but let me just eliminate the y and z directions, talk about the x direction. And then I get something we've talked about before, which is this standard, you know, this thing I did when I did the twin paradox. It was the space-time graph where you got t up this way and x out this way. And again, you can, um, you can put a c in front of that if you want the units to be the same. It's not a bad idea to do that. Um, and then there's something really weird. There's this invariant thing. Now, let me talk about what invariance would mean. Invariance under a transformation means that there's some quantity that you can count on that it won't change when you change everything else. And I'll tell you what that would be in a normal, first of all, let's just pretend this was y and x, just pretend for a minute. If I had two points, you know, x1, y1, x2, y2, like that, and then I did a transformation where I either shifted this thing to the right or the left or up or down or diagonally, or even rotated it. That's what I'm really getting at. If you had like some transparent overlay graph paper stuff, you rotated this thing. There's one thing that would stay the same about this. You'd always have the same distance between the two points. It's the Pythagorean theorem. And the Pythagorean theorem says, you know, uh, I guess something equals, you know, square root of, Square root of x squared plus y squared is constant in normal space. But you've already seen evidence that when you rotate uh, this thing, and when it's when it's actually t in x, when you rotate, or maybe I should say c t in x, when you rotate that thing, it does not all rotate together. It does that weird scrunching up thing. When we did the twin paradox, I talked about that. So a rotation is bizarre here. The rotated axes you get look like this. You know, your CT prime and your X prime are like that with their weird, messed up, um, you know, strange plots. Is there anything that would be preserved under that transformation? The answer is yes. It is a Pythagorean theorem. I'll write it out more generally here. It's that there's something... I'll, I'll write it by equating two things. It would be that the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, um, maybe in the first um, case, uh, I don't know if I want to write it all out. Let's just have that be the coordinates. Uh, would that equal, like if this was like, you know, initial, you know, when you first did it and then you had final over here, you know, x squared final plus y squared final plus z squared final. And I may not have remember which I had done that. Um, is that what it is? That's what it is in three-dimensional space. That's a three-dimensional version of the Pythagorean theorem. But no, wait, there's more. Turns out you can also put time in there. But here's the bizarre thing. The time goes in with a minus sign. Minus c squared t squared. And that's a t initial or something. And there's a minus over here. So, so what you z squared t squared. So it turns out that time, at least when multiplied by the speed of light, plays a role that's much like a spatial dimension, but with the interesting twist that it has a minus sign in front of it in its version of the Pythagorean theorem, the space-time variant thing. There's another way to look at it. If you really wanted there to be a plus sign, you say, no, I want it to be a, a real dimension like all the others. You want it to be a real dimension? Look what you got to do. You'd have to say plus I C T parentheses squared. The imaginary I would be in there because when you square that, you get the negative. In other words, in a way, time is like an imaginary spatial dimension. Now, I don't mean imaginary, not like not real in the sense of not having reality to it, but I mean in the mathematical sense, it's playing the role of, of imaginary numbers. And I'll tell you that this weird rotation we do, where instead of doing like that, it crunches up. It's a hyperbolic rotation. 
a circle, like the unit circle. You know, there you add up the squares of the things and always get the same thing. That's the definition of a circle. Well, the definition of something constant here is hyperbolic. And then the rotation things for it, you know, how like rotation in regular space, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. What is it? It's sine, is it cosine, sine, negative sine? I tend to forget. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's cosine, sine, negative sine, cosine, or something like that. Maybe that's it. Or maybe there's a couple of sines and cosines, which when you're when you rotate, how you define your angle, whatever. In relativity, you get this weird stuff. You get coshes and cinches. I'm not quite sure I wrote them in the right order. I think the minus sign goes away. You actually use hyperbolic trig functions that aren't based on the unit circle, but on the unit hyperbola. I'm just throwing stuff at you. It's just a stuff for you to go look up sometime. It's neat stuff. So anyway, you get these weird hyperbolic rotations of space-time invariant, you know, that's constant, but it involves time, you know, like an imaginary spatial dimension. I love that stuff. So um, having just done a hand-waving presentation of that, I'm just going to throw at you a few more little tidbits about this. Here's one that, that I never mentioned quite. I, I talked about the whole idea of the speed of light being the same for everybody. You know, like if I'm coming at you and I shine a light at you, uh, it leaves me at the speed of light and it hits you at the speed of light. That doesn't seem to add up. Well, person could just make a rule. Light goes the speed of light. What about things going almost the speed of light? For example, what do I do if I've got somebody going nine tenths the speed of light here? I'm going to write that as beta equals 0.9. Beta means V over C. So if I have beta equals 0.9 here, somebody else is coming at it at beta equals 0.8. Now I'm watching this and I'm like, all right, watch them, you're going to wreck. You know, and I think, how bad of a wreck is that going to be? I'm going to think it's a 1.7 C wreck. I think that I should be able to take, let's say this is object number two, I'm object number one, and this is object number zero. Those are good enough numbers. Then common sense tells me that beta of two with respect to zero ought to be common sense wise, the way the world usually seems to work, that I should just add them up that I should say, well, it's it's beta of 2 with respect to 1 plus beta of 1 with respect to 0. If I did that right, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I'm adding the, because because your velocity compared to it is 0.8 that way. And that would be, you know, 1.7. But I can't do that. I can't be going this faster than the speed of light. They can't think they're hitting it 1.7 times the speed of light. They got to come in under the speed of light. I'm not going to derive this. I don't think I could do it off the top of my head, but I've seen it done. Here's the answer. This is what you do. You divide the answer you get in a normal, logical, common sense way by this thing. One plus the product of the two speeds. And the product of the two speeds here is like 0.9. And 0.8 makes 0.72, and that gives me 1.7 over 1.72. Wow, it snuck it in just under the speed of light for me. That'll always work. This quantity, no matter what you put in for beta 2 and 1 and beta 1, you'll never get a number bigger than, um, well, yeah, I don't know if I, I'm not proving that algebraically right now, but it works. And so that's the speed things hit at when you think they were going to hit at some other speed. That's the answer to that. There's also equations for acceleration. There's Newton's laws and, and all kind of kinematics. Heck, there's probably rotational stuff. I'm not going to get into that. I don't think I could do it. I have a few other neat things to throw in. Here's one that we sort of saw earlier when we were talking about the uh, uh, twin paradox. And we had the... Uh, Oh, they were watching each other on Zoom. They were watching each other on Zoom, and uh, as they go apart from each other, they appear to talk too slow. When they come back, they talk too fast. In the particular example, example I gave, if you go back and look at that video, you'll see that the factor was a factor of two in one direction, a factor of a half in the other direction. In other words, when you thought the other person was moving away from you, 
at 0.6c, beta equals 0.6, you got point, you got two times the time to hear something. You know, you saw their birthday messages come only once every two years instead of every year. And on the way back, as long as you know you're approaching and are running into, running into them light waves, then it was accelerated by a factor of two. So you'd get um, like a, two signals a year, two birthdays a year. And it didn't add up to the same for both, and it was the twin paradox, and it was neat. Where do we get the number two? Now, it emerged naturally from the drawing. That's what I love about presenting it that way. No math, just a drawing, and it worked out. But what if, um, what if I want the math? Here it is. I'm going to tell you the thing for what is often called the relativistic Doppler effect. To be really technical, it's not exactly the Doppler effect, but it's a whole lot like the Doppler effect where the car goes by and goes like, yeah. But this is the thing that tells you the amount of redshift or blue shift, like gal distant galaxies moving later, maybe towards you. Um, so what's the equation? Here it is. The frequency you're going to receive is equal to the frequency at made times the square root of 1 plus or minus beta over 1 minus or plus beta. And uh, that's how you get the recession or approach in there. I'll give you an example. Um, if you put in beta of 0.6 and put it there and put it there, and use the top signs, the plus and the minus, then you get 1.6 over 0.4, which is 4, and you take the square root, you get 2. And if you switch those, you get 0.5, you get a half, square root of a quarter. So those, that's where those relativistic um, Doppler effect numbers were coming in. And so now you know another piece of relativistic math. I'm going to finish up with a couple of other ideas. And I'll shut up about relativity, and I encourage you to go learn some more someday because it's neat. Uh, the other little bits I want to show you are, um, first of all, remember when I talked about going to the other star? Uh, when the twin, the twins going, I forget what their names were. But anyway, uh, one of them's flying towards the other star. It's Arcturus. It's 40 light years away. And then with the numbers I used, a bunch of nines after the decimal, uh, I said that that person only experienced four days during the trip. Now, let me tell you what learning relativity is often like. It's often like you're a little bit skeptical. Like, that don't make sense. To me. Really? Okay. But wait, gotcha. You keep thinking you got it. And here's where you might think you got it. You know you can't travel faster than the speed of light. Okay. So how do you get to a 40 light year away star in two days if you're not traveling faster than light? The answer is sneaky. Length contraction. The star is not 40 light years away when you're moving towards it. The distance is shrunk to two light days. That's how you can, or just over, or just under, just over that. Um, that's how you get there. And, yes, that's how you get there so quickly. The distance shrunk. Now I'm going to tell you some thinking I did. I don't remember reading this. I was just thinking about it. I thought like, yeah, what if you decide not to go all the way there and you hit the brakes? What? The, the stars say, say when you're about halfway there, you're like one light day away and it's not that far away. And you're going to be there soon. You slam on the brakes and stop. Somehow that star is now going to become further away, but it does it gradually. So you'd actually find the star to be moving away from you as you approach it. I have not gone into all the math, math of this. I think you'd still get, I, I, I'm not even quite sure about some of the relativistic uh, time dilation stuff things, but I've got some of this figured out. I was wondering, could you use this as some kind of bizarre telescope? See if you follow me here. And it ain't going to work out this way, but, but, but something else sneaks in. Could you use it as a weird telescope where you, like, all you have to do, you don't have to go all the way there. What if you just started heading towards something really fast just for a little bit, making its distance shrink so you can get a really good look at it. You don't actually have to go there. You just, like, stop. It didn't ever get very far in the first place and go back home. Would that work? The distance you measure to it would shrink, I'm sure of that. But it sounds like cheating, and I just don't think you could get away with getting a magnified image. I think like telescopes make things look close, you know? 
Actually, what telescopes do, they don't necessarily make things look close, they make things look big. Because how you focus it as to how close it looks, but it makes things look angularly big. So would Arcturus look like looming big in your spaceship window just because you're moving towards it? The answer is no, and here's why. I'm pretty sure of this. Because there was a problem I remember figuring out when I was in, I took a relativistic astrophysics class, and one of the homework problems, which is in my file cabinet at school, or again, get to it, I didn't think to bring that home. One of those questions was about what happens when you're moving this way. What happens to your field of view? What should be a whole sphere of view, like a whole star field, 360 degrees all around um, like that, when you're moving, it shrinks into a cone. Now, it's not a perfect, just bounded cone. It's actually a rapid drop-off. Uh, things behind you still look to be behind you, but things in front of you are very blue-shifted and scrunched into a small thing. So what I figured was, you may be moving towards Arcturus real fast, and it may be measurably, through some experiment you do, not very far away, but it ain't going to look big because it's going to be contracted like your whole field of view is going to be shrunk around, swung around, and it will be shrunk by like the same factor it looks closer. So it looks closer and smaller. So you'd end up um, not seeing it any better after all. Thing. Other weird things. You're going down the street real fast. Relativity, the far sides of buildings would tend to open up and come into view. You can have, kind of see around corners. There's just a world of weird relativistic effects. Um, I'll mention one last thing. Um, there was a problem I remember having that said that there's a really infinitely thin meter stick. And this is very similar to the Poland barn problem, but with a little twist. Um, and I think I did do the Poland barn paradox. There's a table with a one meter wide hole in it, and this is a meter stick. Now, the problem is, as the meter stick slides along the table, it sees the hole is being smaller than a meter so that the meter stick could not possibly fall through the hole. So meter stick does not fall through a hole in the meter stick's world because it can't because the hole's, you know, say half a meter wide or something. But in the world of the person watching this in the table's frame of reference, the meter stick is half a meter long and should easily fall through. Now you got a question. Does it fall through or does it not fall through? What's the answer to that? Well, I could probably equate it more to the pole and barn thing, but I think what I'm going to do here instead is say that I recall the answer being a surprise in a way. It involves the fact that, first of all, you can't really have infinitesimally thin tables and nor an infinitesimally thin meter stick. And the really important thing is you can't have a 100% rigid meter stick. In other words, what happens is the meter stick will go through the hole because it will sag, mechanically bend, and the, the communication to not bend or bend can't go through the meter stick any faster than the speed of light, so you do end up actually having the meter stick fall through the table in both worlds. But the way it did it in the table's world, at least, maybe in both, is that it bent. It's always a sneaky answer to these things. Now, let me think. Anything else about relativity? Uh, when do you use it? You use it when things go really fast. You use general relativity when gravity gets really strong. It's always there. But the effects don't matter a whole lot until things get kind of extreme. And then there's the whole world of quantum mechanics, which I don't know if I'll say anything about it. No, maybe I'll make a video if I feel like it. Uh, that's, that's some interesting tough stuff, too. And ultimately, if we can combine general relativity and quantum mechanics into some coherent picture, we will have reached some kind of holy grail thing, I guess, of physics. But uh, we ain't there yet. I'll shut up with that. Plenty I hope you get to learn in the future about all this neat stuff.